Hi everybody, welcome back to Find My Past from Home. My name is Ellie, I'm Senior Community Executive for Find My Past and it's Friday. Well done for making it until almost the end of the week. Well, it's the end of the working week in any case. So yeah, this is Find My Past from Home. This is the time where we connect with you, you connect with us, you guys all connect with each other through genealogy, through the past through our shared love of history, all things quirky and emotional. And yeah, this is this is our time. This is your time. It's a it's just a way to sort of wind down into the weekend. We can talk about family history finds that we've made this week. We can talk about our new records because we talk about that every week, of course. We have new records every week. Uh, so please introduce yourself. Let me know where you're tuning in from today. What's the weather like with you? For example, we actually had hail here in Edinburgh about half an hour ago. It was very bizarre. Um, which hot drink of choice do you have in hand? I've just come armed with, with water just for speaking for an hour. And um yeah, you know, maybe maybe some of the surnames you've got in your family tree, you never know. You may meet a cousin. It does happen, everybody, I tell you, it does happen. Now, let's welcome some of you guys in the comments. Uh, we've got Roz from an icy Massachusetts. We've got Victoria, Elaine, Ellen, Daphne, loads of you here, loads of familiar faces. This is great. But of course, you know, if if this is your first time here, we honestly don't bite. We are a lovely bunch. And in particular, if you need some advice on your family history, these are the best people to ask. Okay. These are fun, these guys are fantastic. Our community are wonderful. I I love you guys, basically. Uh, Rosie's saying it's a, a cold, sunny but cold Shropshire, no time to make coffee. Do you know what, Rosie? I'm gonna ramble for about two to three minutes. So if you want to go make coffee now is the time okay i'll leave it till five past before we get kick, before we kick off properly excuse me falling over my words today i've uh, got robin it's cold and snow covered this a cold and snow covered day here in toronto i've always wanted to go to canada i really really would love to go uh, Ka karen from a cold but sunny harrogate uh, got jillian in edinburgh as well what did you think of the hail jillian i thought it was a uh, sunny one second and the next minute it's roof coming down like diagonally so many of you here this is lovely we've got sally it's a very bright day today whitney i've had a good day and feeling positive good me too actually i'm feeling really positive as well so let's let's spread this positivity and this joy a little bit today shall we uh, janet joining us from north wales i hope north wales is okay today it's, it's obviously my, my home my homeland my homeland. I am. I was born, born and raised in North Wales, and I, I hope to be going back again soon because my sister actually turned thirty this month. She's very, very petrified about turning thirty, and I'm just like, yes, it's, it's fine. Thirty's fun. And then a very, very close friend of mine who is practically a sister to me. Uh, she's just had her second child, and I really, really want to go see them as well. So hopefully soon, hopefully the end of the month, I can, can go nip back to Wales and say hello to everybody. Uh, got Andrew as well, quite bright in Lancashire. That's good. So many of you here. This is lovely. Daphne, cup of tea that's gone cold. Honestly, go make yourself another cup of tea quickly. And uh, I'll wait for everybody to get a, a hot drink because I think you do need a hot drink on a cold day like today, especially if you're this side of the world uh, where it's currently winter. You do need your hot drinks, I think, there. Oh, this is very nice, Graham. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's really nice of you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we've got Canada as well. We've got John. Fantastic. So, so many of you. I, I Comments just keep coming in. I can't keep keep up with them. Uh, Anya saying huge thank you to Sophie and Liam from Find My Past for helping me out with issues on my account. Our customer support team are fantastic. And I'm not just saying that because I used to be in the customer support team. They are, they are amazing. They genuinely care about each and every single query they get in. And the amount of time and attention they, they try and give to each query is amazing. And actually, I, I, I suppose it's quite, I suppose it's perhaps a good time to announce this actually. So we all know that Alex sadly left us. Um, was it last week he only left us? Goodness, last week. Anyway, because he was a regular um, Farmer Pass Live host, uh, I decided to try and recruit another one. I'm actually really pleased to announce that Liam 
Boyle in the customer support team at Famapast will be stepping into Alex's shoes from the probably from early March, I would say. And um, so that's really, really exciting. So you get to see him once a month on Fridays Live. And you, if, if any of you guys were in the community this time last year, um, you, I, I introduced you to Liam and also to Jamie and we saw Karen as well in the customer support team. And Liam's wonderful. He's so knowledgeable. He's got a really warm personality. I, I hope he's actually watching today, actually. He may not be because customer support are just so, so busy at the moment. Um, but yeah, that's really exciting news. And yeah, we'll, we'll probably do a joint one to ease him in. But yeah, he'll be fantastic. I'm really excited. OK, I'm going to catch up with myself here. Uh, mentions of chocolates, more cuppers, biscuits. Yes, Rosie is back with a coffee and biscuits. Fantastic. Yes, Daphne, did you not hear? Yeah, so um, yeah, Alex has sadly moved on from Fama Pass, but he's moved on to a fantastic new opportunity and we are going to miss him greatly, actually. Um, but, you know, all good things must come to an end. And I think when you're, yeah, I think it, it's good It's good to move on and try new things, I think, although he was very, very sad to go. He did say he would, when possible, um, try and join these broadcasts to make sure that he can still connect with you all as well. Yes. Oh, my goodness. There's so many people who didn't know. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Um, so Alex actually did his last Friday's Live two weeks ago. And um, he got quite emotional on it, actually, because you should go back and watch it because he was so, so grateful for all of you and the, the fact that you keep coming back every week to, to chat to us. And uh, he said it was one of the things he was most going to miss about Fama Past was, was, was all of you. Um, so, yes. Yes, Liam is going to be fantastic. Um, so, yeah, really, really excited for that. Um, uh, Matthew asking how to turn off subtitles. Right, Matthew, are you on a, a phone or a tablet? Because I, I sometimes watch it on my phone when I'm not presenting. And um, there's a, I think there's a little button that you need to click into and then you can turn them off, I think. You have to go from one button to another. I know that much. Uh, Victoria warned Liam about our sense of humour. No, I think we'll just wait for him to be surprised. I think that's part of the fun. Am I going to take up the banjo? No, nobody wants to hear me play a musical instrument, sing. You'll, you'll be running for the hills, okay? Absolutely. Okay, right. I think we should get cracking. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today we are going to do the new records, and I've actually got some examples of the new records to show you this week because I was really excited about them. We will do question of the week, and if you've not added your question of the week answer in yet, it is, what's been your most unexpected or unusual family history discovery so far? Um, I'm sure we all come across unexpected and unusual ones all the time, but which one really made you go, huh? Which one made you look a couple of times at it to make sure that you'd interpreted it correctly. Actually, that's something I really want to do at some point is a session on interpreting family history records because I don't know whether any of you know, but I, I did my degree in history and then I did a master's degree as well. And, and part of that was source analysis and source critique. And I wondered whether I could apply some of what I learned in that to helping you guys with your family history research. Um, granted, I was looking at records from <laughs> um, thousands of years ago. So I did, uh, my dissertation at university was on, oh goodness, it was so long ago, I can't even remember. Um, it was on Hypatia of Alexandria actually, which is like the fourth, no, the third, third or fourth century BC. And then I did my master's degree in um, the study of the Crusades. Um, so yes, it's a little bit longer ago. And then what we're also going to do today as well is um, building on the great session that Jen did with you guys on Wednesday, which the feedback on that was just fantastic. And I must admit, I was doing the comments at the time and I was really struggling to reply to the comments because I was so interested in what Jen was saying. It was really, really difficult for me to multitask. But I thought we'd build on that today because our team, when they were doing conservation and the scanning of the 1921 census of England and Wales, they came across so many cool and un unexpected things. And they made a note of them. They made a note of like the piece number and schedule number. So then we've been able to go back now and have a look. So I thought we'd show you a couple more of those. And um, 
because this is actually my first Friday's Live this year, goodness it is, um, I thought I could tell you what I found on 1921 Census, just very briefly, very briefly. Okay, right, we should definitely probably get on because it's already 10 past and I have waffled for 10 minutes, I can't, I can't believe this. Okay, so now we are going to do new records and I do have some slides to show you. Um, so if you didn't know already, we are the only family history website to add new records and new newspapers every week. And as I always say, it means that you have a, a new opportunity every week to discover like a new ancestor, find a new story, break down a brick wall. And there might not be something for you this week, but there might be something for your friend. There might be something for you the week after. Who knows? OK, so let me add these slides into the stream and hopefully you guys can all see those now. If there are any problems with those, just let me know in the comments. I can just about see them as I'm looking at the slides. So this is the first record set that we've added this week and it's brand new. And it's the Jamaica Manumission of Slaves from 1747 to 1779. Now, this is quite handy because it's searchable by both the freed person's name and the enslaver's name. We've digitized these from a collection at the British Library. The transcripts that we've made are really, really detail rich. We've just got the transcripts on Fama Past, but what you can do is after you open up your transcript, there's a link that takes you through to the British Library website. All you need to do is take note of the image number from the transcript, and then you open up that particular volume on the British Library website. I'll show you this in a second. And then you'll be able to see the original. And I mean, they're quite shocking to read, but um, they're, they're a fantastic resource. I think they're gonna be really, really wonderful. Even if you don't have uh, you know, a connection to Jamaica and to slavery, and may maybe you didn't have any ancestors who were enslaved, um, these are still really, really fascinating to explore. Um, and there's, a, there's about four and a half thousand of these records. Important to note the language. It's, it will probably offend you because it's the language of the day, but we've kept to that language because that is what is on the original document. So that is important to note as well. There may be more information about the enslaved, um, the, the enslaver than the enslaved person or the freed person. That's important to note as well. And that's just, that's just indicative of the power imbalance, unfortunately. Okay, um, the other thing to note as well is, so the, the manumission document, because, because in Jamaica, it, by law, you had to prove that you had been freed from, from slavery. So the, these are exactly what these documents are. They're proof that you have um, gained your freedom and then you can start to build a life of your own. Um, obviously, it goes without saying, it would have been incredibly difficult for these people um, to then go from go from being enslaved to then building a life. There's so many cha other challenges that, challenges that they faced, but this was this was just the first step. So yeah, let me show you an example. Um, let's just flick over there. Okay, so I had a look at Cassandra James's record and. Um, this is the kind of detail rich information you get on the transcript. So I've got the enslaved person's first name and you can see here that the first name and the surname have been included in the, uh, they're in the first name field. You've got the manumission date. Um, you've got the uh, a description, uh, some comments. So we note that she's got three children. We note the name of the enslaver, um, his status, his address so we know that he was at um, St Andrew in Jamaica the year of the record which was 1752 and the date of the record in particular which was the 3rd of November 1752 and when you click through to the British Library this is the kind of record that we're dealing with here so this is half a page now I have hope, thankfully <laughs> transcribed this so I'm you know, don't have to read all of this um but let me just read some of this to you. Um, I, John Williams, of the parish of St. Andrew in the said island, um, in consideration of the many faithful services done unto me, I have formally called by the name of Cassandra, who has since been christened by the name of Cassandra James, and also for a further consideration of the sum of £118, 15 shillings, current money of Jamaica, aforesaid to me in the hand paid by Jacob Mesquita. I think I transcribed that wrong of the parish of Port Royal gentlemen, 
Um, and then I'll just skip ahead. Um, I, I do hereby acknowledge I have, and by the presence do manumise, I think, enfranchise and forever set free from all manner of servitude, slavery and bondage. And it goes on to say that uh, Cassandra has her uh, three children as well. So Jacob, John and Carolina, I put here, but I think that's actually incorrect. Um, and then it, you've got the date as well. And I was really intrigued to see what happened to um, Cassandra and her children after this. And I didn't have much time to look today because it's been a very, very busy day. Um, but um, I did find this and I thought this was fantastic. This is um, this is a baptism record um, for Jacob, uh, Jacob James, John James and Caroline. So all three of her children were actually baptized on the same day, on the 21st of July, 1758 at Port Royal in Jamaica. And what is really interesting here is that it says that they are the children of Cassandra and Jacob. I think it's Mosquito. I'm, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. And it says that he's a Jewish man. Um, so and he's the chap, I think, who paid for Cassandra to be freed from slavery. So I just think that's fascinating. So they obviously had a relationship, whether they were married or not. I'm not sure at this point. And he paid to free them. And then the children are being baptised um, six years later, even though he does not share Cassandra's faith. I just think that's lovely. And I really hope that they had a happy ending in their story. Um, yeah, I just thought I'd, I'd share that with you. Um, next up this week, we've added around uh, 700,000 records into the National Burial Index for England and Wales. And the new records cover Kent, Leicestershire, Staffordshire and Rutland. So if you've got ancestors from this area, you're going to want to go and have a look. Um, I just wanted to show you an example of I think this is one of my ancestors, actually. I do definitely have a Samuel overthrow in my family tree. One or two anyway. This is for Gloucestershire. These are transcript only, but they're quite detail heavy. So you've got the, the age, you've got the, um, the burial date. I think it's burial date rather than death date, but they're normally not too far out to just to give you an idea. And then it also gives you the denomination as well, which is really, really handy. Um, normally handy in, in helping you find out if you've got the correct person because you can sort of match denominations a little bit. Like to water because I'm parched already. Okay, right. I think that's it for new records. The only other thing to say is for the new newspapers. So there's seven new titles this week. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them because there's a really long list, uh, but they are all available on the blog and there's all links for them as well. So if you want to go and check out one in particular, you just click the link and away you go. Fantastic. OK, right. Let's do question of the week, shall we? So just as a repeat, so what is what's been your most unexpected or unusual family history discovery? Um, so that's what I would like want. I would like to know this week. Now, William, who couldn't join us today, I think he's working, did submit his in advance. And he said that the most expected one for him so far has been when he discovered in the 1921 census that there were other extended family members extremely near to a great uncle. Um, he said at first glance, it appeared he'd moved to Croydon without any relatives nearby. So there's a little bit more for William to explore there. And I, as always, I really want to know what happens, basically. OK. So I am going to have a scroll back up and I'm just going to see if I can catch any questions of the week. Forgive me a moment while I find them. Yes, lots of people mourning Alex leaving. I know. I feel like I've, I've yeah, just, I'm, I'm sad. But I'm pleased that, you know, he's moving on in his career and stuff. It's going to be great for him. Okay, right. Okay. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Oh, Matthew saying it was, he was emotional and it showed. Yeah. Alex has never been one to be able to hide his emotion, but that's fine. It's just, you guys know it's genuine then, don't you? Um, okay, okay, okay. Oh, Roxanne saying a session of interpretation would be neat. I will try my best. I will dig out all of my old uni folders as well. 
Jen's session was brilliant. It really was. It was such a good one. Okay. Karen, crush of the week. My first cousin, four times removed father-in-law, was accused of letting Napoleon go. <gasps> You're joking, but found not guilty. Oh, but that's still, that's still pretty cool. I love that. Love that. Paul, I was shocked and surprised to find I'm related to Virginia Woolf via her father. When did you find that one out? <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing oh that's wonderful absolutely wonderful oh Rocco that's so sweet Alex was a tour de force thank him for all that he did he's a champion he'll always have a free drink if he ever comes oh that's so sweet we'll have, we'll have to do a meet up of some, some, some kind uh, Kim says, so many unusual and unexpected discoveries that I don't get surprised so much anymore. The latest, which was lovely, my maternal great uncle on the 1921 census built the housing estate that my paternal grandparents moved into as new build. And then myself 80 years later. Oh, I love that. I love that. I love the connections that you can make just from a couple of records. It's just wonderful. Uh, okay, Jane says, I found signed documents from my great-great-grandfather about his age to become a letter carrier in 1865. At first, not sure if it was the correct person as he was a bootmaker, later found a newspaper article about his funeral that verified it was him. That's fantastic because otherwise you probably would have discounted that. But because you then found additional evidence, that meant that it matched up. And yeah, fantastic. My apologies, everybody. I'm not very erudite today. I'm because towards the end of the week, I start my brain just starts having a bit of a meltdown. <laughs> okay, right. Okay. Janet says, I knew two of my great uncles went to South Africa, but didn't know that their sister had three illegitimate daughters who also went there too. <gasps> Have you managed to trace them? Are, are there any descendants? I, I need to know. I need to know more details. Okay, um, that is a very good question, Karen. Um, I do believe we're hoping to do more similar to this, but I don't. I, I don't know. I need to check in with um, probably with like Mary's team and people like that, and Jen. We'll see. Okay. Sue says the marriage of my three times great grandmother. She'd had a child three months beforehand, and he wasn't the man she'd mentioned in the order of removal. Interesting. These are these are fantastic, you guys. Quite early on, discovering that my surname doesn't match my ancestors, in 1891, the clergyman wrote down what he thought he heard, not what was said. Andrew, you'd be amazed how often this happens. I've noticed it happen in my fiance's family tree as well. And whoever wrote it down wrong got it so wrong, but they must have just written literally written down what they had heard and then you for a generation you get some of his ancestors who have this wrong name and even if you even if you did wild card searches on this name it still wouldn't match his actual surname it's it's crazy um sally says my most unexpected find is my mum's birth mother since finding her i'm now in contact with a living relation and i'm crossing everything for some pictures oh I'm, I'm crossing everything for pictures as well. That's fantastic. I'm so pleased to hear that. Paula says, to find my great-great-grandparents in the 1901 census that they spoke Irish. It warmed my heart as I'm learning Irish myself. It made me feel so connected. Oh, I love that. I must admit, I do get a little bit... I, Although I'm from Wales, I'm not fluent in Welsh. I learned it up to the age of 16, but only as a second language. And when I look at records for people like my great grandfather, when he was a boy, he only spoke Welsh. He couldn't speak English when he was a child. And it just makes me, it makes me think I should take up Welsh again, <laughs> basically. Oh, excuse me, everybody. Okay. Gail says, when the new wife died, her husband married her mother. When her father was dying, he requested he take care of his... Oh. Some of these are so sad. 
moving, but also quite sad. Um, Anya says, finding that a whole load of cousins were part of the very early church of LDS and they married, excuse me, migrated from Scotland to Utah in the 1850s. Amazing. Wouldn't have known it without DNA. DNA is such a key resource. But what I find fantastic is taking your DNA results and things like your matches and then matching those up with what you know from your family tree and your family history records and using them together is just it's just something else, I swear. Um, okay. Okay, I'm scrolling. Uh, Graham, first cousin, second times removed sister-in-law was a survivor of the Titanic. Gosh. When I, I think I've said this before, but when I was... Um, a young whippersnapper of a girl, um, when my great grandmother was alive, she used to tell me that she had a cousin who was an officer on board the Titanic and that he didn't survive. But then when I've gone to speak to my, my mother and my grandmother and my grandmother's sister, none of them know anything about it. So I don't know whether it was just made up. <laughs> it could have been made up. I mean, to, to be fair, they, although she was, how old was my grandma when she, great grandma when she died? Was she about 92 or 93, I think? But she was, you know, she was all, she was all there. She was, she was wonderful. So I don't know, actually. Okay. Um, blah, 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 blah. Okay, I think I'm to the end of the um, comments there. Unfortunately, Matthew, you seem to be having some trouble with the subtitles. I'm really sorry, I can't help. Facebook is just sometimes... A little bit silly maybe you go watch it on youtube that's another option because this is also streaming to youtube okay the next thing i want you can also keep coming the keep your questions of the week answers it coming in if you want but i am going to move on now because i've got some really cool things to show you so i'm going to add my slides back okay let me just i'm going to remove that logo because that looks a bit funny Okay, there we go. Okay, now I did promise to show you or talk to you a little bit about what I found in the 1921 census. And I'm just going to touch on this very, very briefly, just the most exciting things. Like, because like all of you, you sort of, you know, you limit who you want to search for because of, because of the pay-per-view nature, obviously. So I, I searched for a small handful of people. And this was who I searched for first, uh, my great-grandfather, Ralph Overthrew, who you will see at the bottom of this census return. So what we're going to do is, um, with this, I want you to think back to the session that we had with Jen on Wednesday about picking out little clues from records and how you might take that clue to find, find the next step, the next piece of information. So you guys are so good at this. So thinking caps on. I don't know how well you can see these, but I've tried to blow them up as big as I can on here. Think about what, what information would you pick out, okay? And where would you go next? Feel free to just add these into the comments and share ideas and things like that now obviously with this one this is my own this is my own ancestor so i i already i already know the cool things about this but um hypothetically let's say that i'm coming across this for the first time and i this man i don't know that this man has a connection to me okay so let's have a look here what what, what might i learn from this so we've got ralph he's a single man he's a visitor in the household of john foster and it appears that, let's bring this up, there we go, John and Ralph work in the same place. They work for the Knighton Cadbury factory. It tells me that Ralph is a chemist, John is a labourer. Maybe they knew each other. They probably did. They probably knew each other quite well. Maybe they were even friends. Maybe Ralph needed somewhere to stay the night. Maybe Ralph was over for dinner and decided to stay over. I don't know. But yes, yeah, so, so, then, so then you start thinking, well, where, where would you go next after this? I mean, he's a single man here. Um, maybe the 1939 register. That would be a good shout. And um, maybe let's also see who he, who he married, shall we? I mean, I know this is like spoiler alert, but yes, I already know this. 
and here we go. So this is Ralph's marriage record two years later in 1923 to Sarah A. Foster. Foster. And then, I, then on the 1939 register, uh, we've got Ralph, Sarah, children, Derek, one closed record, and then Gordon. So if we just go back to that now, to that 1921 record, the handwriting is awful, but one number four on that list is Sarah Ann. So this is how my great-grandfather and my great-grandmother met. They met through Ralph and John both working for Cadbury. And I suppose you could say that if it were not for Cadbury, that I wouldn't be here. I always knew I loved chocolate. Anyway, yeah, I thought that was quite sweet. <laughs> no pun intended, actually. Um, OK, so I've got one more to show you. And there isn't really a story behind this, but there is something quite cute on it. Um, so this is the record for, uh, this is who I looked at next. This is the record for my nana, Mary Eileen Dobbs. She was born in 1920. She's here with her parents. And I think there's a sibling and then there's a couple of lodgers and then a visitor. Now, I've not looked into the lodgers and the visitor. Um, but take a look at this. Um, do you notice anything unusual about it? Um, while I let you look, I will just tell you that my my nana, um, yeah, she was fantastic actually. She um, her first husband died in nineteen sixty. Goodness, was it nineteen sixty? Yes. So when my father was two years old, and she then had to bring up four children on her own, and I think she did a great job actually. My dad and my uh, aunts and um, uncle, fantastic people. So she did a she did a great job. And I always remember that she was very good at knitting. She liked knitting things. I remember this sort of, I don't know, like tea cozies and things like that. Those are the kind of things she liked knitting. Um, okay, so the interesting thing that I spotted about this record was that Kathleen, my great grandmother, she filled it out, signed it, and then so did my great grandfather. So I've got both of their signatures next to each other on this record, which I thought was really special. OK, let's show you some more. So I'm going to show you some some of the stuff that was now that was found during the conservation digitization process. So when the team came across something interesting, they'd note down where they found it. And then they, we've been able to find those now. So I'm just going to show you a few of these. So this one here is Edward Francis Brookman. And he's living alone. He's 59 years old. And he made some interesting comments on his census return, which I thought, thought were quite sweet and also a little bit sad as well. So he notes himself as the head and tail of the household, as opposed to just the head. He's widowed and orphaned. He was born in Compton Dando in Somerset, but he said, do not tell anyone about this, okay? Whether he was ashamed of it or not, I don't know. And then we also get a little bit about his work. We don't just get that he was a carpenter. We also get that he worked with mostly wood, some glass, much putty, and a little oil and varnish. He makes things like a chicken coop, a cow shed, but also things like conservatories. I thought this was really, really sweet. Really sweet to see... You know, this is 59 year old chap who sadly lost his wife. He's living alone. Um, he's probably still working at this point. And um, he's having a little bit of fun with his census return, which I think was really nice. Before I move on, I'm just going to go back to the comments quickly and just see what you guys are saying. Um, great detail. Yeah, I just I love these sorts of things. They, are, I think they're just fantastic. Um, Claire says UK Cadbury wasn't as nice Australian Cadbury. I haven't been able to compare that, but I do have some relatives, I think, over in Australia. So maybe the next time they come over, I'll get them to bring some and I can do a taste test. Oh, Linda said she had to go. Oh, have a good weekend, Linda. Okay. I did see a question about the Titanic, actually. Um, if you have time for your, a name for your relation, I can check my Titanic reference books. Yes, the problem with this is that my great grandmother, her maiden name was Joan Smith. Joan Smith. 
Um, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't even have a first name. Um, so that, that could be interesting. Maybe I just need to go back to my family tree, actually. Um, uh, Sue was asking about crew lists. Um, I think they're included. Are they included in the passenger lists? I think they are on the ones we've got on site, actually. Don't quote me. Don't quote me on that. I'd have to check. Um, OK, right. Let's move on. So the next one I want to show you is this one. Um, so this is quite sad, actually. So this is a chap called Robert Kilford. I think he's down as 29 and he's living alone in 1921. Now, on his census return, he actually writes um, a plea for help. And I'll show you this in a second. But just note this down a second is the, um, the number of children he's got. He's got a child who's one and a child who is six. And this is the note he left. This is the notes he left. There we go. <laughs> It'll appear eventually. Um, so it's really quite sad. So you've got this, this chap here who's living on his own. And he says here that he doesn't know where his wife and his children are. And apparently uh, his wife was with another man who was wanted for desertion. And he asks that through the census, could they could they please find his wife and his children because he wants to be reunited with them. Now, I have no idea of the circumstances behind this. I had a quick look in the newspapers. Actually, this is where I want you to be thinking now. Where would you go and look next? Um, I did go and have a look in the newspapers, but I couldn't see anything in particular. So do you think that you can posthumously help Robert find his wife and his children? Were they reunited? Did Were they forever more separated? Um, this is what we want to know. What clues would you take from this to go and find out? Where would you go next? Which records would you check? Um, yeah, Matthew's saying that's so sad. I wonder if they were reunited. Um, so while you guys are having a think about where you would look, I'll show you what I found. And this is what I think, okay? I'm not 100% on this. As I said, I haven't had much time to prep for this session today, so you'll have to forgive me. So, oh no, that's the next one. What I did find is that I think Robert married a lady called Harriet Reed in 1913. And it looks like between 1914 and 1930, they had nine children. And... There's a gap between a child born in 1919 and then the next child wasn't born, to, born to, until 1922, which would fit what we're seeing here. Now, I did find them on the 1939 register. Robert, Harriet and three of their children. So it looks like they were reunited. Now, as I said, I do not know the circumstances around this. I, I don't know if this is a, you know, a genuine plea for help, or if she's, you know, taken the kids away somewhere and got stuck for a couple of days, you know, maybe couldn't get a train home, who knows, okay, I, I have no idea. But what we can see is that he was distressed enough to write this little note on his census return. And then by, you know, by 1922, it, it appears with the birth records, they were reunited and they were <clears throat> having more children, living together again and on the, the 1939 register together. There we go. <clears throat> OK, um, I'm just having a look at the comments again. Lots of people saying that's really sad. Absolutely. It is really, really sad. Um yeah. Oh, uh, Mark. Great question from Mark, actually. The note to find his children is dated the 19th of June, two months after the census was filled out. How? Really interesting, actually. So the census was originally supposed to be taken in April 1921. And because of um, potential strike action, they actually postponed the census. But they rather than pulp the forms and reprint them, they decided to use the forms that they already had, thus the confusion with the dates. And trust me, it's confused many, many people, in particular people actually on the census who filled out the census returns. So this is why um, the forms say April, but this little note says the 19th of June. And that's when it was, po was postponed. Excuse me, I can't even say the word postponed. No, I still can't say it. I'm just going to I'm just going to slide over it. Um, 
So yes, this is why that happened, basically. Census was delayed, exactly. Okay. So yeah, that's the end of that story. I've got a couple more to show you. Um, so have a look at this. What unusual things can you spot here? So this is Charles Summerscales. He is a motor engineer. He's 38 years old and he's living alone. Now, take a look and see if you can see anything out of the ordinary on this form. Um, what else can I spot here? So he worked for J Lyons & Co, I think, at 106 Chatham Street in Liverpool. So, yes, and what I noticed is this. It's a vertical note, and I've turned it around so you don't have to strain your necks. Um, it, it actually, uh, while I mention that, um, when you're viewing images on Find My Past, we do actually have a rotate button, which I always forget. And when I bring up a record that I need to look at the other way, I do end up tilting my head. And then I remember there's a rotate button. It's just right at the top, top right-hand side. So this says, grass widower through the war, no leave, broken promises. And I think that says rotten government. So from my understanding, a grass widow would somebody, be somebody whose husband has been away for a long period of time. There may be abandonment there as well. Not sure. But he's listed himself as a grass widower. So I'm uncertain of the circumstances here again. Um, were they separated because of the war? throughout the war they seem to be separated now two years after no three years after the war ended I can't do maths apparently because he's still listed as um yeah it doesn't actually say it doesn't actually tell us whether his wife is whether he's still married to her uh, whether he's divorced um whether she's since passed away it just says grass widower I assume she is still alive but I don't know anything else on top of that uh, Roxanne, how have I not noticed this? Ellie, you've just saved my neck. Quite literally saved your neck, Roxanne. I always forget it's there, but it's a great little tool. You can also actually, funnily enough, on the, the tools on the original images, you can also change the brightness, the contrast, and you can invert them, which is really, really handy, especially if you've got a record that's particularly faint. Um, so yeah, now with this one, I struggled with this one I don't know if you guys can find anything else I thought I found his wife but I'm not 100% sure so I've not shared this shared that finding because I'm not certain but yeah I thought that was this is quite a sad little sad note actually and I think it shows his bitterness as well there doesn't seem to, the only blame I see attached there is to the fact that, the fact that because of the war and also blaming the government, it doesn't look like he's blaming his wife, for example. But yeah, I'd like to know how that story ends, but I just, I haven't, I haven't cracked that one yet, I'm afraid. Oh my goodness, I, I've dropped some serious knowledge here. I didn't know you could do all of those things. <laughs> Maybe I just need to do a session on things you didn't know about Find My Past. And yeah, maybe that would be good. Yes. And just to clarify again, you open up an orig original image on Find My Past, top right hand corner, you can rotate the image, you can change the brightness, you can change the contrast, and you can invert. There you go. Right. I'm about 15 minutes ahead and I have. A few more to get through. Okay, let's have a flip through here. Okay, now I shared this one on social media uh, yesterday, at some point this week, and I thought this was lovely actually. So this is Oliver and Gladys Baker. What do you notice about this record? And no cheating, if, I, if you've already seen the social media post, no cheating. No, I'm joking, you can still take part. Um, what do you notice about this particular record here? And um, I thought this one was fantastic, actually. And somebody actually did comment on the social media post saying, 
what about the descendants? Do they know about this? Why don't you do a follow up? I did have a very quick look earlier to see if I could spot any descendants. Um, I think I need to spend a little bit more time on it. Yes, absolutely. Matty's saying Gladys is listed first. Equal partnership, joint heads. We love to see it. Equality in 1921 for the husband and wife. Well ahead of their time, in my opinion. Joint heads, exactly. I thought it was fantastic. So, yeah, it seems that Oliver's Oliver has filled out the census return. He's listed Gladys first. And then it says... In the relationship to the head of household, it says wife and husband joint heads, which is fantastic. And then it says at the bottom, and a partnership in equal terms. And then the enumerator in the green ink has gone and put a question mark by it, as in as if to say, what? What's one of those? <laughs> this is what equality looks like, my friends. A partnership on equal terms. I think I might work that into my wedding vows. <laughs> so there we go. I thought that was really sweet. And if anybody would, would like to track down uh, the descendants of Gladys and Oliver, um, go for it. See what we can find. Challenge. Oh, yeah, I, that, that's just showing you that in a little bit more detail there. I'd forgot I'd superimposed. Okay. Uh, okay, I think I'm on to my last one now. And I did save the best for last, if this is the one that I uh, I think is I'm coming on to now. Yes, here we go. Now, I don't know if anybody's seen this yet. I think we've included it in one of our blogs. So I'd, I'd say, do you notice anything unusual about this record? But I think it's quite clear to see. So... This is the record for Constance Beatrice Halstead. She was 36 years old, living alone, apart from her cats, who she also enumerates. Uh, yeah, Matthew, there's a lot there. Yes, and I think I would be here a while if I read out everything. Um, interesting enough, if you go and search for the record and you open it, She's actually written on the front cover as well. And I think there's also a letter that's been scanned as well. Yes, the handwriting is quite small, but I'm going to blow some of it up. Uh, so this says, it is well to be strictly accurate. And that I am, I can't read that, of furnishing all of the information possible to satisfy our grabbing, grinding governments, both with lo both local and central. Cats names, there's only one cat named. There's one black kitten. And then there's also a half-bred Persian cat by the name of Lily. There we go. And what else have we got here? So she's put down a couple of clues about her profession. Desirous, thank you, Sue. I, I'm not. Yeah, this was me. This was me trying to do this 15 minutes before we went live. OK, so for her profession, we've got part time music student and then begging system profession organist. Not followed for livelihood, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, we've also got this was this was my favorite one. Um so when she's been asked, well, not her particularly, but when they've asked on the forms to note the children, information requ required only respect of married men, widowers and widows. That's the only time the census actually requests you, you to put children in. She comments, what about those persons illegally baited? Why spare their blushes? <laughs> Oh, my goodness. I, I get this because this isn't the only comment she makes on people who are uh, living together or, her, or who have children together without being married. That's not the only comment she makes on this. So I get the feeling that she had some strong opinions on that. I think she had an absolute blast filling out her census return. And this is the interesting thing. She's She's actually filled it out correctly, but then she's gone. She's well, I can't even find my pen. She's gone with her pen and she's gone. 
I wonder what else I can include. And it, I don't even think that she's written this all in one go either. I think that she's, over the course of the evening, I think she just added more and more in. And I sort of picture her sitting there with the cats and possibly with a small glass of wine and just thinking, and do you know what? I'm going to add this as well. I just thought it was fantastic. I mean, though, I think on the front cover, I think she made some very awful remarks about the Welsh, which I wasn't a fan of. But I can't help but, yeah, I think I think it's brilliant. And I think if you are, if you're a relation of consent, Constance Beatrice Halstead and you come across this, this is a gold mine. This is such an insight into her mindset. And you don't get that from census records. They're very deep, they're very detail light normally, actually. And you normally Yeah, I mean, the, the, how how can I explain this? Because wh when you when when you get a census return in, you get instructions on what you should be including because this is what the government want you to include. She's included all of that and more, and more. Yeah, at the, the top. I haven't superimposed this, but she she puts um, underneath. Please please read the instructions and examples as shown on the back, and then fill up the schedule carefully and in ink. She puts. What about those who cannot read, mark, learn, and I think that says inwardly digest, I think. But yeah, I just think it's, I think it's absolutely fantastic. I really enjoyed this. I think this is the last one I wanted to show you, actually. Um, but in any case, <clears throat> I did go and see what I could find out about Constance. And I'm just going to consult my notes because I wrote these down. What did I do with the? Here we go. Um, oh, also, she wrote under strictly confidential, very doubtful. That's what she put underneath that. Um, so, uh, nineteen eleven census. It appears that her her parents, I think, were both drapers. Um, in 1939, she was living with her brother, James, who was a physician. And that by that point, she was listing herself as a retired musician. Um, in 1906, according to the newspapers, she passed her grade three organ exam with honours. In 1932, she was appointed organist of the county cinema. Somewhere, I can't read my own handwriting. In 1946, her brother James left her money to set up music scholarships, I think. I think they were music scholarships. And then th I thought this was quite sad, actually. Um, so I found her um, probate record. She left about £5,000 in 1962 to her sister Ida. But in the newspapers, it says that she died last seen alive 26 of March 1962, and her body was found two days later. So it, it does appear that she was still living alone. So yeah, that is that. Those are all the examples I wanted to show you today. And we are five minutes ahead of time, which is fantastic. Uh, yeah. And I think the conversation has turned back to chocolate. <laughs> I actually had a crunchy bar earlier, Robin, and it was really, really good. Um, yes, that's there as well. Um, Denise saying, all this detail will be missing with the online forms. You're absolutely right. So the census that was done for England and Wales last, was it last year? Yeah, that was all done online, wasn't it? So we're not we're not going to have the opportunity to be a little bit playful with our census returns anymore because it's all done online, and we're not going to be able to read. Well, hundred years from now, people aren't going to be able to read our handwriting and our signatures and our quirky little commentaries. I think it's a shame. I think we should all go back to. I, I I I love writing things. I love I love writing things with my fountain with my fountain pen actually. 
Um, okay, Rosie says, um, Charles Summerscale's wife Florence appears to be in Birkenhead in 1921, may have died in Cornwall, 1934. Probate says she's a widow. Um, but da, 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 da. okay, I'm just scrolling up to have a look at some of these. Um, Denise says there was a news agent called Halsted when I was growing up in North Cheshire, presumably the name of the shopkeeper. They also sold sweets, which is why I remember them. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, lots of you saying how outspoken she is. Not a fan of living in sin, no, no, she wasn't. Um, Andrew saying Halstead is a common surname in the Burnley area where my early ancestors came from. Yes, this is this is why this is why with with transcriptions you need help because when you do them on their own you always make mistakes or I always make mistakes. Um, yes, uncomfortably married. Yes, yeah. I just I just thought these were fantastic and I I wanted to show you because although when we come across our own ancestors in records, um, you know, they, 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 they can sometimes appear pretty pretty normal if you're just looking at that one record. Um, but it's nice, I think, sometimes to come across that little bit of extra information that you just were not expecting. Um, and how every, I mean, we, we've talked about this so much over the last few weeks, but just how everything in a family history record could be a potential clue. Um, yeah. I think that's my takeaway of the, of the day. Everything can be a clue and don't overlook anything. You might think that your ancestor has appeared on every single record, putting their, um, their birth date as one thing. And then on one other record, they put it as a couple of days out. For example, that's a clue. What does that tell you? Um, okay, I think we're just about coming up. So I think I think we will wrap up if that's okay. Um, so I'll just let's well, let's hold on. Wait, Kilford Reed married 1913, nine children by 1939, two sets of twins. First set of twins died in 1914. That's so sad. But you guys are so good at this. So good at this. Robin saying thanks for another great session. You are most welcome. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Marion saying thank you as well more than welcome thank you guys for joining it's been lovely uh, Beth saying my great grandfather worked in Cadbury showed him working there in 1921 England and Wales census I wonder if your great grandfather and my great grandfather knew each other which I want Beth I want to know which um, which Cadbury factory did your great grandfather work at because mine worked at Knighton OK, that's where my great grandfather and his future father-in-law worked. That's how they met. So I want to know because our great grandfathers may have worked together. That would be really cool. Um, OK. I think we are. Yeah, I think we'll wrap up there. So uh, in terms of what's happening next week. So I am going to do a session on Wednesday on love stories because we've got valentine's day coming up and i thought it'd be quite sweet to see how you can spot love stories in family history records because sometimes you, you don't get that impression and i just want to give you a few tips on how you can find those so yes the hour does go too fast matthew but uh yes it's, it's time for the weekend um look after yourselves everybody make sure you relax over the weekend um recharge do something you enjoy and we will catch you next week on wednesday and then jen is back on friday for friday's lives friday's lives friday light no <clears throat> i've lost the plot take care of yourselves and i'll see you next time thank you for joining today Bye bye <laughs>